Meet the crew of Artemis 2. We might have the perfect date for a Mars mission, and astronomers discover an ultra massive black hole. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. Now that Artemis 1 is in the rearview mirror, all eyes are on the Artemis 2 mission, and this is where four astronauts will hop into the Space Launch System, an Orion capsule, and they'll fly out to the moon, go around the moon, spend about 10 days total on the mission, and return to Earth. And now we know the astronauts who are going to be taking this trip to the moon. And keep in mind, like, humans haven't been to the vicinity of the moon since Apollo 17 in 1972. So here's the team. We've got Commander Reed Wiseman, Pilot Victor Glover, Mission Specialist Christina Koch, and Canadian astronaut Jeremy Hansen. And obviously, as a Canadian, I am excited about the fact that a Canadian is flying on this very exciting mission. I, I don't know if he's going to bring along some kind of robotic arm, but I think that would be very appropriate for the mission. And Jeremy's going to be the first non-American to go to the vicinity of the moon. I say the vicinity because they're not going to be landing on the moon. That'll be the Artemis 3 mission. But still, what an honor to have a Canadian get close to the moon. So when's this going to happen? Now, if all goes well, the mission will blast off in November 2024. But you know, that's a rough estimate. Delays always crop in. So don't be surprised if the launch date pushes back to 2025. But I think we reported recently that the core stage of Artemis 2 is coming together. So all of the pieces are being assembled at the same time that now the crew has been announced and they're starting to train for their mission to the moon. So it's another concrete step forward. And hopefully, this is just going to make it feel a lot more real that after Artemis 2 comes Artemis 3. And on Artemis 3, human beings will be walking on the moon again for the first time in over 50 years. The perfect year to go to Mars. About every 26 months, there is a launch window to go to Mars. You need a time when the orbits of the Earth and the Mars line up so that you can leave the Earth, follow an elliptical orbit, and then have that orbit cross Mars, and then you can go into orbit around Mars. And we get these launch windows every 26 months. And that's why you always hear like every two years or so, the next crop of spacecraft that are gonna be flying to Mars. Now the problem with sending humans to Mars is it's a long trip. You've got to spend about six to nine months on the way there and then six to nine months on the way back. And then you either get just a couple of months down on the surface of Mars, or you have to spend about 18 months on the surface of Mars waiting for that alignment to happen again so that you can come home. So in the best case scenario, you've got a couple of years in the worst case scenario, you've got over three years that you're spending in space exposed to all of that radiation. But there is a really cool alignment that comes every 15 years. And the next one is going to be in 2033. And what it'll mean is that the Earth, Venus and Mars will all be aligned in a way that a spacecraft can launch from Earth, get a gravitational assist from Venus and arrive at Mars, and then be able to return and the whole mission will take about 1.6 years. So a new paper from NASA is proposing that they take advantage of this 2033 flyby opportunity and send a crew on this flyby th past Venus, get a gravitational assist, fly to Mars and do a flyby of Mars and then return to Earth and do this all within just over a year. Now, obviously, it would be better if astronauts went down to the surface of Mars, but this is how you start. I mean, with Apollo 8, the astronauts flew past the moon with Artemis 2, which we just talked about. The astronauts are going to fly past the moon. It makes sense that the first mission that's going to fly to Mars, they fly past and then come home. What else is cool about this paper is that the team suggests that this can be done with the existing planetary exploration budget with a lot of the existing technology, they would probably launch in a space launch system, they would transfer to a spacecraft that would allow them to go to Mars. And 
nothing is going to be outside of the current level of expertise that NASA has. So we're not looking at a new nuclear rocket engine. We're not looking at some kind of fancy ion engine. This would all be within the current capabilities of NASA. But 2033 is coming up pretty quickly. And so if they're able to get support behind this idea, then we're gonna to have to see a pretty serious shift towards making this mission happen. But it's a great opportunity. I and mean, when you think about say, the great alignment that happened for the Voyager spacecraft so that Voyager 2 was able to go to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, you want something similar to happen with humans going to Mars. And then hopefully we'll have worked out a lot of the kinks about the mission. And then you can imagine another crew going several years later with a mission that's going to take a little longer. Astronomers found an ultra massive black hole. All right, you've heard of black holes. You've heard of supermassive black holes. So here's a new one for you, an ultra massive black hole. Astronomers think they've found a black hole with 30 billion times the mass of the sun. That is billion with a B. When you think about the mass of the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way, it's 4.1 million times more than the mass of the sun. So this is much, much more massive. And the way they found it is new and kind of interesting. So what they did was they looked at a region of space that they knew had gravitational lensing, and they're able to see the effect of this galaxy cluster on background material where the light rays were coming through this galaxy cluster and making their way to us. They ran the distortions that they were seeing in the picture through a supercomputer. And when they did, they calculated that the only way to get that level of distortion is if there was a point size gravitational object with 30 billion times the mass of the sun. So they were able to calculate exactly where this ultra massive black hole is, and then figure out what kind of gravitational lensing it's causing. And so this is a pretty great technique. And so you can imagine them using this to find more of them. And for those of you who might be worried about a supermassive black hole with 30 billion times the mass of the sun, don't worry. It's 2.7 billion light years away, also with a B. So it's very far away. JWST takes another planet picture. James Webb is slowly working its way through the planets in the solar system. We've seen pictures of Jupiter, we've seen pictures of Mars. And this week, we got a picture of Uranus. And what's amazing about this picture is one, we're seeing the planet with the rings face on because of course, Uranus has a tilt that puts it on its side. And so for part of its orbit, we're seeing the equator, and we see the rings edge on and then for part of its orbit, we see it face on and we can see the rings. The other part that's amazing is that the rings are just so distinct. Now these rings are actually very faint, and they're only visible with the largest telescopes on Earth, space telescopes, Voyager 2 spacecraft was able to see them when it flew by. But for most telescopes, the rings are invisible. But JWST is an infrared telescope, the rings are made of dust. And so it was the perfect machine to be able to observe the rings of Uranus with this level of resolution. It's a it's an astonishing picture. And I really like it. The team also released a second picture, which is a wide field view. So not only do you see Uranus with the rings, but then you also see six of its moons around it. And again, just an amazing picture. And that is JWST's full field of view. Every picture that we get from JWST has the potential to be this wide angle shot like this. Perseverance is cloud watching. Now, most of the time, the Mars rovers are supposed to keep their cameras locked on the ground. They're looking at rocks, they're blasting rocks with lasers, they are taking samples. But every now and then when the conditions are right, NASA has the rovers look up into the sky. In some cases, they've watched moons passing around Mars. And in this case, Perseverance saw some clouds drifting across the sky. Now clouds on Mars are rare, but they do exist. You know, most of the time we see the dust storms, the dust clouds, but just regular clouds are there too. They can be composed of water ice, the particles are actually very small, like one to four microns across, you can also get clouds with carbon dioxide ice particles as well. So I love this idea that the rovers are crawling around on the surface of Mars. But in this case, just before sunrise, Perseverance looked up and saw these clouds rolling by. Is Starship about to launch? 
Now we don't have an official launch date for the SpaceX Starship, but a lot of things are starting to happen that are making everybody think that a launch is imminent. One thing that we got was an air traffic advisory from the FAA for April 10th. And it looks like this isn't going to be the actual launch of Starship, but probably a very significant test that's going to run through the countdown and refueling and sort of everything in preparation for launch. We also saw an official announcement from SpaceX on their Twitter talking about an upcoming launch. And so people are starting to think that we'll see a launch from Starship mid April. So we could be about two weeks away from seeing Starship blast off. There is one problem that could delay the launch. There is a civil suit that's saying that SpaceX hasn't done enough to mitigate the environmental concerns at the launch site. And so if that actually goes through, then we could see a further delay while SpaceX has to continue to ensure that the Starship launch isn't going to cause damage to the sensitive environment at Boca Chica. And so the consensus seems to be that we'll see Starship launch on the 20th of April, 420. Ha ha. Well, here's hoping. China tests a Stirling engine in orbit. When you're close to the sun, you can use solar panels to create electricity for your spacecraft. But when you're far away from the sun, and you're not getting a lot of sunlight, you have to use some other method of power. And the one the main method that spacecraft use is a radio isotope thermoelectric generator. What it really is is just a decaying chunk of plutonium that is sitting inside the spacecraft. And then that's hooked up to a thermocouple that then translates the heat from the plutonium into electricity. And it works. I mean, it can provide a few hundred watts to a spacecraft, but it's not very efficient. And it sort of has its limitations on how far you can push this. And so in the future, we could see spacecraft powered by fission reactors like NASA's Kilopower reactor, or I know Rolls Royce is working on a fission reactor for the moon. And so this week, we got an announcement from China that they had successfully tested a Stirling engine on board the Chinese space station. Now Stirling engine is kind of like a thermocouple. It is a engine that moves hot and cold gas through a bunch of cylinders inside the engine. And then it's able to move magnets around inside the engine and generate electricity. So on the one side, you've got say a fission reactor that is generating heat, the heat is heating up a gas inside the Stirling engine, the gas is being moved around, and you are getting electricity coming out the other side. Stirling engines have a lot of benefits are used here on Earth all the time. They don't have a lot of moving parts, they're very dependable, we really understand the physics involved. And so to see one of these Stirling engines tested in space, I think is a really great accomplishment. We know that the Chinese have proposed a mission that would fly to Neptune using a fission reactor. And this gave a lot of advantages, they would have a lot of power they could use for an ion engine, as well as generate all of the electricity that they would need for all of the instruments on board. And so for them to test a Stirling engine in space is sort of like the middle part, the part that turns the heat coming from the fission reactor into the electricity they're going to use for all these purposes. So it's a pretty big accomplishment and a pretty serious step forward for high power space missions in the future. A water based propulsion system tested in space, a Japanese company called pale blue just successfully tested a water based propulsion system on their I satellite, it's a small sat. And its only job really is to test out if this propulsion system works in space. And they have a chamber inside the spacecraft, they heat up the water and then they blast it out and the spacecraft gets a kick in the opposite direction. Now water is definitely not the most efficient propellant that you can use, but it is simple. And so you can imagine some future spacecraft harvesting water from the moon or an asteroid, heating it up with solar panels, and then blasting it out as a method of propulsion. So you can imagine the spacecraft refueling itself from asteroid to asteroid. And we've seen other ideas like this steam powered engines being tested and proposed. And so it's great to see just another version of this idea being tested in space. If you like the work that we do here on this YouTube channel, and you want us to have a truly independent space reporting 
company, you should join our Patreon. It's a way for you to just support the work that we do to make sure that we can always remain completely independent, but you get a lot of benefits. If you sign up to the Patreon, I will remove all the ads from the Universe Today website for life. Like you can just sign up one time and then cancel your account right away and you will have an ad free version of Universe Today for life and you will have given us more revenue than we get from advertising from any person ever. So definitely consider that. Also give you advanced access to many of the interviews and other videos that we do behind the scenes as well as special videos that are just for the patrons. So go to patreon.com slash universe today. Virgin Orbit files for bankruptcy. So we got the news this week that Virgin Orbit was having a lot of trouble. We saw they were halting their work. We saw that they were laying off a bunch of people. And this week we heard that they are filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Now that doesn't mean that they're going to go completely out of business, but it is not a good sign. Uh, there's about 800 people who were working with Virgin and they've laid off about 85% of them. They've accumulated a deficit of over a billion dollars. They've been working on an airplane launched rocket system for several years now. They've had a lot of their projects in development. They've done a couple of tests. They had a failure. They had one success. They had another failure. And I guess just with the accumulated development costs, the lack of revenue coming through the door quickly enough, they just weren't able to keep the operations. And I guess Branson didn't want to keep funding the operation. So here we are. So it might get acquired by a competitor or they might be able to lay off all the people, consolidate the operations, get it back operational again, or it may just go out of business. We'll have to see what happens. Now, keep in mind that Virgin Orbit and Virgin Galactic are two separate organizations. So Virgin Galactic, that's the space tourism company where you'll fly in a parabolic orbit, fly to the edge of space and return. And Virgin Orbit is the company that was launching rockets from a 740. 47. So two different companies, Virgin Galactic is still fine. And Virgin Orbit is the one that filed for bankruptcy. We know how a solar storm killed the Starlinks. So last year, there was one launch of Starlinks that almost entirely failed. What happened was a very powerful solar storm was blasted off of the sun. When it reached the Earth, it increased the density of the thermosphere, which increased the drag of any spacecraft that happened to be flying through the thermosphere at the time. And now normally there are no spacecraft flying through the thermosphere, except when rockets launch. And so Starlink had just launched a batch of its satellites. They were at their initial orbit, and then they were using their thrusters to raise themselves up to their final orbit. While that happened, the density increased and they weren't able to reach their altitude and they started to descend and burned up in the atmosphere. And the irony of this is that we did get enough notice that this solar storm was going to happen and the folks at SpaceX could have delayed the launch of the Starlinks to wait for the solar storm to arrive, for the density of the thermosphere to increase and then to go back to normal and then launch their satellites. But they didn't. And so they lost that batch. But I think that sounds like a very powerful life lesson learned. So next time we see a big solar storm, I'm sure we'll see the rocket companies wait until the effects have passed before sending their spacecraft up. All right. Those are all the stories that we had today. Now, if you want more information, you want to do a deeper dive, we've got links in the show notes down below. You can get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word, there are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There, you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent and keeps our ads at a bare minimum. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Jay Dennis, David Giltonen, Modso, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbioff, Andrew M. Gross, and Josh Schultz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us. All right, that was all the news that we had today. We'll see you next week.